can hear you. The time is oh, this is the time is approximately ten minutes after ten. My name is Martha Robinson. I'm the Associate General Counsel of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene for two more days. <laughs> <laughs> also, here, also here is Frank Cashulo, who is the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau for Child Care. We're here today for a public hearing on whether the Board of Health should adopt amendments to Article 47 of the New York City Health Code. A notice of intention to amend this article was published in the City Record on June 15, 2016. We're here today for the public hearing um, for your comments on whether the Board of Health should adopt these amendments. And a copy of the first page of the Notice of Intention has been provided to the reporter to include in the record. Persons wishing to speak at the hearing were asked to pre-register. If there are any other persons who, are, uh, who have arrived uh, after I initially said uh, we have a registration sheet, please, if you want to speak, please sign up right now. We'll call upon those of you who pre-registered. We have one, we have two people who, who've registered. The first person is Lisa Caswell. Ms. Caswell, could you um, spell your name? Have a seat over there. Press the button that has the face on it. Uh, speak into the mic and also uh, indicate any organization that you're with, please, and spell your name for the reporter. Sure. My name is Lisa Caswell. I'm with the Daycare Council of New York. My last name is spelled C-A-S-W-E-L-L. -L. I'd like you to just stop me at the point of five minutes. Um, first of all, of all, we want to thank you for holding these hearings and for the consistent efforts you've made to improve and strengthen the system. Uh, we have some general concerns and then specific concerns. Um, the first one relates to teacher and trainer qualification verification. I'm just going to read directly. Uh, while we applaud the DOHMH in the attempts to strengthen the qualifications and backgrounds of trainers and teachers, the proposed amendment in its present form only leads to more questions and concerns rather than clarifying the desired goals. The most compelling weakness is that potential teacher and trainer documentation, which contains personal as well as professional information, will be given for review to an agency designated by the department. It appears that DOHMH will be outsourcing this core work, usually handled by a regulatory body. Specific questions arise. First, what kind of decision-making matrix will be used to choose this agency? Is it a government agency, nonprofit entity, or for-profit enterprise? Is it a sole source contract, or is it an RFP expected to be issued to establish this agency? Is the vision to have a subcontractor to assist DOHMH in its regulatory work? Second, when individual teachers and trainers deliver mandated information and credentials to this agency, how will the safeguard of this information be assured? When given to this agency, who then owns this information, and what are the parameters around how it is used? Third, who will have access to the data that is received by this agency? Will individual teachers and trainers have access? Will employers, potential employers? Will New York City or New York State agencies have access? Who is the gatekeeper of this data? Again, while the intent of the proposed amendment is to strengthen teacher and trainer qualifications, much more information is needed before creating an agency designated by the department to carry out basic regulatory work. Our next few questions um, are specifically related to the subdivisions, but we have a general question that has to do with where will the money be found to fund all of these new regulations, given the uh, constraints that the child care system is currently facing. The specific questions have to do with specific articles. Subdivision F, applications to be completed. This revision seems overbroad in that centers may be closed if information is missing on a renewal application. A renewal application may be missing information simply due to human error. A penalty of closing down a center as a result of a mistake seems too damaging to the center, its employees, and the parents who rely on it. There should be some opportunity for a center to correct a mistake or to have a hearing before its permit is revoked. Article 47.19J. Services for certain children. 
This new rule requires providers to allow certain professionals who have not been screened through fingerprinting, state central registry review, and references process to have access to children receiving assessments and services. The proposed rule does not identify how providers will know whether these individuals have been screened or have been approved to have access to children. Will providers receive a letter beforehand informing them that the individual is authorized to have access to children? In addition, how are providers staff to know how to evaluate a person's credentials prior to providing access to children? Providers have an immense responsibility to protect the children, and one of the safeguards is to check fingerprinting records in the state central registry. Providers and parents must have a reasonable assurance about a person's background before providing access to children. There's just two more. Article 47.33C, Staff Immunizations. The new rule requires each staff person and volunteer to certify that such person has been immunized. Due to this rule, providers will be placed in a position where they may improperly discipline or terminate an employee that has a legally recognized basis for not being immunized. For example, an employee may have a religious objection to vaccinations and immunizations, such as a scenario that recently occurred when healthcare providers raised religious objections to the mandated flu vaccination. If an employee raises a religious objection, uh, an employer generally has a legal duty to op op accommodate the objection unless there is un an undue hardship. Failure to accommodate the objection could result in employment lawsuits and liability for discriminatory actions. The rule may also unfairly impact staff who have valid medical reasons why they cannot receive an immunization. For example, a person may have an allergic or harmful reaction to an immunization. DOH needs to clarify whether employees with medical or religious concerns may be exempted from the rule or whether the rule must be strictly followed, resulting in the person's employment being terminated. Such a clarification will prevent unnecessary claims against employers based either on anti-discrimination laws or protections against unjust terminations in collective bargaining agreements. And this is the last part. Article 47.21A3, Corrective Action Plan. The new rule proposes that a corrective action plan may be required when the department determines that the permittee has been operating with serious uncorrected violations over a period of time. If the corrective action plan will only be required after a citation and finding of a violation, or after a finding that a prior corrective action plan has not been followed through, then the rule change appears repetitive. If the corrective action plan is needed before any finding of a violation, then the rule seems to require a corrective action without a process for establishing fault. So these are very detailed responses, but we thank you for your efforts to update the code. And you have submitted these in writing, correct? I have 10 copies. I don't know where to All right, just give them to us. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, the next person who is pre-registered is Alice Mulligan. Ms. Mulligan, just spell your name and indicate any affiliation you have. Yes, Mulligan, M-U-L-L-I-G-A-N. I'm the Executive Director of Our Saviors Lutheran Preschool in Brooklyn. As an early childhood facility licensed by the Department of Health since 1969, we have always adhered to the requirements of Article 47 of the Health Code. As we know, one of the many components of this code includes fingerprinting for criminality and clearance, from the State Central Registry for Child Abuse and Maltreatment, SCR, for all people who have the potential for unsupervised contact with children. As required, we have always screened staff, volunteers, student teachers, and SEATs. These screenings are currently done digitally, <coughs> allowing us to be directly notified of an arrest or of a child abuse allegation against anyone with access to children working in our building. This winter, while attempting to process a new SEA to begin services for a pre-K child with special needs in our program, we were informed by the DOE that there was an internal agreement between the DOE and the DOH and that we are now relieved of our obligation to run security checks, as such individuals are already cleared by their agencies. We were also <coughs> told that our attempt to obtain clearance would cause a delay in the child's educational program. We are now faced with having to rely on the discretion of other vendors, agencies, to inform us if one of their employees working in our building has been arrested or accused of child abuse or maltreatment, as we will no longer be in the direct line of notification. At our Saviors Lutheran Preschool, we believe that we can no longer attest to the security of our own building. 
New York has made great strides in recent years in its efficiency of running security checks. As a DOH licensed school providing UPK services, we routinely process individuals for criminality through the online PEX system. Their status of eligibility or ineligibility is instant. SCR clearance is also online and those results are usually within five business days. Reliable systems are in place and we believe that we can both meet a child's educational needs as well as ensure their safety. Children in New York City should not be faced with an either or scenario and deserve to be both educated and safe. Mayor de Blasio's push for pre-K fall has resulted in tens of thousands of children entering daycare and school facilities. We have seen and will continue to experience a marked increase in the number of children in need of special education and similar support services in the coming years. We believe that this attempt to relax critical and sound Article 47 security requirements for persons who come in contact with children in DOH licensed school, schools will only result in children being hurt. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else here who wishes to testify? Yes? Um, I have something that I'd like to say about the address. Well, please, please come up, identify yourself for the record, indicate. Uh, your, yeah, we'll sign up and she'll sign up afterwards. And spell your name for the reporter and indicate your affiliation. My name is Jennifer Simon, uh, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-S-I-M-O-N. -E I'm with New York Kids Club. Um, and. I'm sorry, I walked in a little bit late, but I do have some things that I'd like to say about some of the requested changes. Um, in terms of the requested changes for the Ed Director, uh, we believe at New York Kids Club that the request being made is only addressing a symptom of the real disease, which is that children's services um, struggle to keep certified teachers on staff because most of us, especially those of us that only operate partial day programs, cannot afford to pay salaries and benefits that are competitive with DOE. This inevitably turns us into a stepping stone for young teachers that understandably end up leaving us when a DOE role comes along. So the real detriment to our children comes not in the form of a missing certified teacher, but rather from the inconsistency of the revolving door created by trying to continually fill this role. Many major cities, including Chicago, Boston, and Washington, DC, to name a few, have policies that do not require certified teachers in preschool and daycare. <coughs> but rather require facilities to buy or use accredited curriculum to ensure educational standards are being met. It is the belief of our organization and the parents that we have uh, asked and polled and that we serve that adopting a similar policy in New York City would greatly improve the quality and consistency of child care. This would also eliminate the wage gap that's currently been created by the UPK PK programs. When a facility brings in a PKA program, the DOE provides salaries for those certified teachers. This DOE salary is often much higher than the salary provided by the facility to non-PKA teachers that are also certified, but may be teaching in a non-PKA classroom for twos or threes. This gap currently discourages certified teachers from accepting or keeping preschool positions that are not in a PKA classroom. Um, we also would like to make a statement regarding the uh, request uh, regarding permit suspensions and revocations. Um, in my decade of experience working with field inspectors from the Bureau of Child Care, I found that the vague language of Article 47 is open to a wide range of interpretations. I've personally witnessed a facility receive a suspension because the Ed Director was out sick and no sub was available for that day. Because of this, I have many concerns about this proposed change. Revoking a permit is a serious step, and the parameters for which it could occur should be thoroughly detailed in the regulation so providers understand exactly what to expect and what the expectations are of them from the agency. Additionally, not allowing anyone from the organization to apply for a permit for five years should only be implemented in the event of a lost child, fraud, severe injury, or death, or otherwise serious issue. Otherwise, we are denying facilities the opportunity to improve. We do agree with the mandate to make improvement classes mandatory for facilities that receive suspensions. Thank you. Thank you. Is anybody else here uh, who wishes to testify? <coughs> if not, then the hearing is going to be adjourned until um, 11.45.
morning. Louisa Higgins, L-O-U-I-S-A, last name H-I-G-G-I-N-S, and I am representing the New York Early Childhood Professional Development Institute based at the City University of New York. Uh, the New York Early Childhood Professional Development Institute is in full support of the proposed amendments to Article 47 of the New York City Health Code Specifically, the changes related to sections 47.13, 47.15, 47.17, 47.37 that would require child care programs to submit teachers and trainers documentation for review to a qualified agency. It is our belief that outsourcing the verification of educational information for education directors and teachers will lead to increased program compliance and will allow DOHMH field staff to focus their efforts on increasing program quality. Currently, education verification happens on site and is not tracked in a data system. There are lead teachers on study plans to achieve certification who have seven years to meet the education requirement. However, a teacher can move from one program to another and there is no mechanism to track this movement. In addition to education and certification, High quality professional development is an integral component of program quality in early childhood settings. Providers of professional development should be qualified to offer training across the range of topics related to working with young children. We support the proposed amendment to have trainer documentation reviewed to determine if individuals have the education and professional experience to teach on particular subjects. An enhanced system for tracking teacher education and professional development supports the national movement towards creating career pathways for the early childhood workforce. Supporting career advancement and individualized professional growth can have a significant impact on the abilities of the workforce and on overall program quality. The New York Early Childhood Professional Development Institute is confident that the proposed changes to Article 47 would move the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene forward in their goal to provide high quality services to New York City's youngest children. Thank you. Is there anybody else here who is will, who's, uh, ready to speak? If not, then uh, it is now 10 minutes of 12 and uh, this hearing is closed. <laughs>